so let me introduce um, Pedro and Pedro Priglatnitsky has been working with the center uh, for quite a while now and he's been translating uh, ECC articles into Portuguese and um, he's a professor of philosophy at the State University of West uh, Panama and uh, between 2016 and 2020 he was professor of philosophy at the State University of Maringua and his research focuses on early modern metaphysics and natural philosophy and particularly the perspectives of uh, Descartes and Cavendish and um, Cavendish is also the person he's going to uh, talk about today. Pedro, the floor is all yours, and we're delighted to have you here. Thanks, thanks, Claire. Uh, everyone is listening to me uh, okay? Yes, we can hear you, yeah. Okay, uh, so first of all, uh, let me, thanks, uh, let me thank the organizers, especially Clara for this invitation to take part, to present my research in this wonderful conference, which I'm learning a lot with every, every presentation and paper that I could uh, that I manage to follow. Uh, also, uh, Clara, can I share my screen? I uh, guess you should be able to do okay. that now. Okay. Uh, it's already, can you see? We can see the first, uh, we can see um, still the, uh, you know, no. the, not the presentation. Yeah, perfect. Can you click one further just to see it works? Because I had this uh, problem before. Yes. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Fantastic. Okay, that's great. That's great. So uh, the, the talk that, that I will give today, it's uh, part of a uh, work in progress on Cavendish metaphysics and uh, the foundation of that her metaphysics uh, have the, uh, the fundamental of her metaphysics and her natural philosophy and her system of nature, right? So uh, this, this is a part on, of a project on, on her concept, concept and conception of substance and how these concepts can relate and presents an alternative concept of substance in the context of mechanism uh, in the 17th century. So I will focus on here on uh, individuation and the relations between parts of matter and matter as a whole. So the plan of my presentation will, I'll start with the introduction, uh, very short introduction of natural philosophy in Margaret Cavendish, uh, then talk about uh, the problem of individuation of bodies in early modern philosophy, uh, some aspects and some central context, concepts and Cavendish metaphysics, and then the main focus will be the notion of individuation in, in, in Cavendish and a problem. I will not present a solution of this problem, but a problem of interpretation of some key passages when she seems to be supporting uh, uh, perhaps incompatible views of uh, individual bodies, such as parts of matter as independent entities or parts of matter as abstractions from the whole of matter. Okay, so the philosophy of nature occupies a central place in Margaret Cavendish's highly diversified body of work making up most of her philosophical output. In the search for the establishment of the causes of all natural phenomena, we find three aspects that represent Cavendish's approach, materialism, vitalism, and panpsychism. Cavendish's materialism has peculiarities that distinguish it from the materialism customarily associated with 17th century philosophers of nature. For her, the corporeal nature is moving, alive, and has cognitive abilities. Matter, therefore, has the intrinsic ability to move. Motion, 
as a property of matter cannot be transferred without the matter that supports it also being transferred. For Cavendish, motion is not obtained by something external to matter, nor is it, is it something independent. She rejects the mechanistic model of motion, which assumes the transfer of a quantity of motion between one part of matter and another through collision. If a part of matter has a certain amount, or a certain degree of motion, that characteristic cannot be lost or communicated without changing, changing also the unity of that part. Cavendish's accounts of for life in nature uh, by claiming in her first work, Poems and Fences, this very short proposition that all motion is life. Human beings are alive, she says, because they are material beings composed of matter with varying degrees of motion moving in a distinctive, distinctive pattern. For Cavendish, that is all that is needed for something to be alive. Note, though, that all things in nature, from humans and animals and plants down to minerals and artifacts, are the things they are because they are composed of matter with distinctive patterns and degrees of motion. We might therefore say that Cavendish natural philosophy is committed to a panvitalism or animism. But we must remember that her views depart from the Cambridge Platonists and Van Helmont in denying that the principles of life are to be explained by reference to incorporeal powers, entities, or properties. All matter is to some extent alive, and all of nature is infused, infused with the principle of life, but this principle of life is simply motion. A direct consequence of the essential link between matter and motion for Cavendish is that there is no motion without knowledge. Each element and part of the whole of matter that we have that we have in the world exhibits a peculiar activity. This activity or behavior is exemplified by its own peculiar motion. Such complexity, in turn, would require some type of cognition or knowledge. Cavendish, through her examination of the nature of matter, comes to the conclusion that all material beings all the things that exist in, exist in nature have knowledge, sensitivity, and rationality. An analysis of the precise meanings of this notion in her work is required. But it seems clear that Cavendish supports the thesis that all things in nature have a mind or mental properties as peculiar as this nation of material mind may be. In other words, she defends a form of pan, excuse me, So if this is the picture of the concepts that compound the major position of natural philosophy in Cavendish, this position has to be counterposed with the picture, the big picture of the alternatives, the theoretical alternatives that she's facing. So in the view of the the view of, if I can may, if I can present a general view of the natural philosophy in the early modern period, you have something like that. Right? Uh, everything that we call an individual physical object, from planets to the particles that compose our bodies, in the context of mechanism, is nothing but a part of extension. The only thing that exists in nature at least in this physical realm of reality. The whole of the physical universe is, con is conceived as a single object that might be considered in parts, but those, those parts have their being in a der derivative, derivative way. So the whole is the proper being of nature and the parts of the, of the 
mechanism picture are problematic in, in, in our beings in a derivative, derivative way. Such universe is uniform and homogeneous and also full of motion. The question is, do individual bodies count as genuine material things in this worldview or only extension itself? This conception of bodily nature, as the mechanist natural philosopher will tell us, have the consequence of the refusal of atomism and of vacuum emptiness. So the material world is composed of infinitely divisible matter that exists in a planet. The ontological unity of these parts constitutes a long debate among scholars of early modern philosophy. But when we examine their work on physics, for example, we'll notice that the causal interaction of particular bodies is taken to be responsible for the generation of motion and all of natural phenomena. Because particular bodies play a central role in the explanations of natural philosophy, despite their problematic ontological status, their individuation is a major point of contention. So what is the ontological status of bodies? The, object, the objects that we observe in the world are complex. They have several properties and characteristics. We can approach them from a variety of spect, aspects. We generally assume that those objects we observe are individuals and that despite their complexity, they form a unit. That is, each object, each object is one thing since its properties are attributed to the same unit. For example, Pedro is short and has blue eyes. Besides that, an individual must be distinct from all other individuals that appear in the observable context. A notebook in a room is distinct from a desk that is close to it and from the dust that has just been wiped from it. These individuals also appear to endure during through time. Their existence has some duration. They continue to exist as the same individuals, even if they change in many respects. Not all, as not all aspects, but many of them. So without Aristotelian hylomorphism, the notions of matter and form are no longer available to play this role in the same ontological framing. The substance that would bring together the characteristics of matter and form no longer accounts for the complexity and unity of individuals in these terms. Nor, prime, nor can prime matter account for the numerical difference or, or for the way in which identity is preserved. In the early modern period, we find a modified concept of substance and the rejection of its Aristotelian background has consequences consequences in the way philosophers conceived of the individuation of physical objects. The mechanical approach has its difficulties, as we've seen. By rejecting the metaphysical framework that supports the mechanical model, Cavendish must present a deep way of conceiving the nature of extension and its relation to its parts. But for, for us to understand her conception of individuation and its relation to, to, to substance, we must see some key concepts of her, of her metaphysical stances. Cavendish is a monist, at least in the respect to the kinds of things that exist. She asserts that there is only one type of substance in the world infinite matter, existing as a whole in an eternal planet that is self-moving and self-knowing. Thus, all individual creatures depend on the nature of this substance and are composed of it. By rejecting the mechanistic model of motion and change, Cavendish assumes that motion is a non-transferable mode, necessarily inherent 
in the material substance as an intrinsic capacity. As a consequence of this monism, she rejects the possibility of vacuum, since as the world is constituted by a single material substance, to assume the existence, the existence of emptiness would be incomprehensible. This planism is associated with an ex explicit anti-atomism, at least in her more mature works, such as observations upon experimental philosophy and in grounds of natural, for natural philosophy, where the material substance is understood as infinitely divisible. So the material substance that represents the most fundamental entity of Cavendish metaphysics has two aspects or two characteristics. In an, in an inanimate matter and animated matter. The animated character being represented by sensitivity, rationality, and motion. These aspects, in turn, are mixed in such a way that there is no possible part of the matter or the whole of matter that lacks sensitivity or rationality. This doctrine, which has been called as complete blending, states that the bond between the animated and inanimate aspects of matter is not simply an arbitrary combination of the characteristics of matter. Complete blending demands that every portion of matter will have both aspects as joint principles, principles for its determination. Animated matter and inanimate matter are aspects that have specific characteristics which are completely mixed in nature. We may say that inanimate matter denotes the quantity aspect by means of which the sensible and irrational aspects of matter operate. The sensitive and irrational de degree of matter provide the variety of configurations of matter that exist in the world. Thus, reality for Cavendish is made of of matter and its central property is motion. So what would be bodies for Cavendish? How do we introduce variab variability into this world from a single substance that is whole and infinite? Cavendish indicates in several passages that individual bodies are parts of matter and their, their variability is introduced by the different motions that these parts have. To be a body is to be a part of the material substance. The principle used for the div division of the parts is the motion that the parts of substance has, the material substance has. In this sense, such a substance would have motions that allow the, the, the edification of individuals, individual units in its parts. For bodies, motion is an essential feature. The identity of body or part of matter is determined by motion, by its motion. So transferring, transferring it, which also implicate in a change of its identity. A body cannot provide motion without seeing it to be what it is. There, there are, which are not, now it's my suggestion, two ways of interpreting, interpreting the thesis that motion is the principle of individuation of bodies in Cavendish, namely a realistic one and a phenomenalist one. Cavendish indicates that finite individuals are portions of matter that have a specific configuration that is maintained through the affinity, affinity of the smaller parts that compose it. This would make that portion of matter a natural individual inserted in the whole, which is the material substance. An individual whose parts conspire with the aim of remaining unified in the world. In this sense, Cavendish uh, would appear to assume that an individual's unity depends on the deliberate action of its constituted elements a desire to remain united. 
and that we derive from the rational characteristics of the animated matter that constitute it, and from its principle of self-motion. What sustains the unity of parts of extension as parts that is particular as particular bodies is their own motion. Hence, the parts of nature would be causally individualized by the motion and defined with the facts. With the facts of the self-moving substance on motion. Cavendish would claim in the vision that is presented now that parts of the natural world have intrinsic motion, which entails that they are able to determine their own actions rather than being determined by something external, independent from it. In claiming that the parts of matter also have intrinsic motion, Cavendish is implying that the nature as a whole does not causally determine its parts, which is problematic. This interpretation presupposes an effective and independent causal power of the parts of matter in relation to the whole. Thus, in identifying a basic ontological unit of bodies, they would be existing parts and in some sense independent from the substance. Despite being properties of properties and determinations of the substance, they would have a degree of independence that would reveal them as individuals per se, at least in the causal aspect. Okay. Here I bring the major quotation of the observations upon experimental philosophy, which Cavendish is discussing the relations between uh, the nature of matter as a whole and what are the parts of matter and how they are com combined to form the event, the events that we observe when we observe things in reality. Okay. And this quotation here, this passage is very complex. Uh, many scholars of Cavendish uh, disagree about the correct interpretation of it. And I'm suggesting uh, some that, that, that here we can perhaps uh, understand a different uh, approach to it, which is not the real, realistic one, which I just described. Okay. But there is another way to interpret this process. Each finite individual has its own ability to move because it has, has its own portion of the animated matter. There is, however, only a single infinite matter in nature. And what we think of as finite holes in nature are just stable figures in relation to a perspective. Finite individuals are temporary nuclei of motion, sensation, and rationality. But their temper temporary unity is not the result of an intrinsic process belonging to such individuals. There is no ontological mark that makes a human different from a rock or that ontologically, ontologically distinguishes one individual from another. Now, to argue that both nature as a whole and its parts have their own motion in the sense of having causal power and self-determination seems to presuppose a difference in meaning between the type of motion of the parts in relation to the type of motion of the whole or an inconsistency in such theory. However, the parts may be seen as the arbitrary divisions and in that sense, it would be necessary to abandon the causal conception of motion that determines the unity of the parts. The distinction between such things is not a real distinction in terms of a Cartesian theory of the distinctions. Okay, now it's not a distinction between complete concepts that could designate a complete individual per se. That is a distinction between two different things, but with two different conceptions and of one and the same thing. 
So it's not a real distinction, it would be a, a, a distinction of reason, a rational distinction, a conceptual distinction. The division of the parts of matter seems uh, arbitrary. Distinguishing things through relative motion depends on choosing a point of reference. Can individual bodies be independent causes of their own motion if you assume they are caused by the motion of the totality of nature? Okay, to answer this, it's necessary to examine how Cavendish understood the nature of motion and causality, which I'm not doing here today, but I'm pointing to, a prop, to maybe a, an opening of inter an interpretation. This passage here has many elements that need to be carefully analyzed. Its aim is to present the nature of the parts of the material substance and how they are formed. Parts are not indivisible like atoms, and there are infinite parts within a continuous body. The division is caused by intrinsic motion of material substance. So that all motions that are in nature are within, within reality. And being various and infinite in their changes, their division are divisions of the substance. And the parts of nature and the nature as Cavendish says in this quotation are one thing. The only criteria for different, differentiating parts from each other and from the whole are the particular configurations that they exhibit. That is, when moving, the, sub the substance favors the formation of individuals who have some unity. S such parts have figures, and through these figures, you can discern one individual part from another. So far, we seem to have a causal principle for the production of parts, namely the motion of the material substance, as well as an epistemic principle. The differentiation of one part from another by the figures they have. So figure, figures and uh, to figure and figuration are a major concept in Cavendish's theory of individuation. But uh, are these figures in the parts of nature? But are these figures in the parts of nature formed by their delimitation as parts, or they are caused by the motion of the parts? In other words, is the motion responsible for forming the parts also the generator of the figure of the parts, or is it the motion of the parts that produce the figures? In his regard, the passage is ambiguous. At first, we have the explicit statement that the figures by which we differentiate one from the others are caused by the particular motions of each part. In this case, it's not clear what exactly the motion of the material substance does to divide the parts. Delimiting the parts and providing them with some unit seems to presuppose in a material context the provision of some stable configuration. However, this configuration would be different from the figures that allow one part to be discerned from the other, since these are generated by the particular motions of each part. Okay. How, how much more time I have? Maybe five or ten, 10 minutes is fine. 10 minutes? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, between these two approaches that we, of reading this passage, this quotation, we can have two possible views of Cavendish's monism. Okay. It's not a question if she is supporting or uh, a picture of reality with more than one principal property or more than or not cent centralized in matter. It's the, the, the question or the problem of inter interpretation here is if this monism, if, if this materialism indicates only one entity in nature, 
which is there is only one substance, which is the whole of matter. The, and the parts of nature are absolutely dependent upon the substance nature, or harmonious is a kind of, uh, it's a kind, a monism of a kind, it's a type of substance. So the only kind of substance that, that, that are, are possible are material substance. But numerically, we can have many material substances. This seems to be implicated by the way we read the, the causal efficacy of the parts. If parts are causal efficacious, so we must assume that they have some kind of independent independence from the whole. And how, how, how strong we read Cavendish monism is, is defined by the causal power that we attribute to the parts of nature. So we can have these both pictures. We, if, if you assume that only substance, as of all, or the only substance that exists is, is the whole of nature, so parts of nature, individual bodies, are abstractions of a substance, are properties of a substance. Or the other model is if parts of nature indicate uh, individual, individual that have, have causal powers per se, so they can be considered individual material substance. And the whole of nature is also a substance, but it is a substance in a sense that is the totality of individual bodies and the totality of individual substances. Note that Cavendish goes on to state that every motion is a motion that belongs to the material substance. This is, this is explicit. So every motion in nature is a pro property of the, of the substance when substance is understood as the whole of nature. Since everything is some aspect of the material substance, it seems clear that all motions in the physical world belong to it. Nevertheless, to state that figures are caused by particular motions seems to presuppose an independence between motion, between the motion of the substance in general in relation to the motion of the parts. If the motion of the parts is nothing more than the motion of the material substance partially analyzed, it does not seem possible to conclude that the figures that allow the discernment of the parts are caused by the parts. In the end of the passage, uh, Cavendish identifies the motion of the material substance with the parts. This, in turn, can be interpreted as, a confirming, the, as confirming the hypothesis that the delimitations of configurations by the material substance as a whole is the result, the result of its motion. That is, that the very activity of moving is what it takes to be a part of the material substance. So coming to oh, yeah, coming to my conclusions, uh, for Cavendish, common sense physical objects, what she calls bodies, in plural, or parts of the matter, are mind-dependent entities. Their identities as individuals depends on the recognition by some observer of the motions of matter, which in her picture of reality is another part of matter in some sense, is the matter as a whole. They are real insofar as they are part of the material substance as its determinations. But as individuals, they are an abstraction of a whole that grounds every aspect of nature. The motions that they exhibit are motions of the material substance. And the foundations of, as motions of the parts are parts, are, of, of the parts proper is only phenomenal. This conclusion is supported by the occasional approach to causality developed by Cavendish. Also, the problematic concerning the reality of different levels of independent motion is avoided in this idealistic approach. Individual bodies are not parts of matter that have substance-like behaviors or properties. They are determinations of matter that can present some relative and temporary 
stability and unity. Thank you.